Hi there, I'm Walt Jaquith, Applications Expert for Imaginet Technologies and Certified Inventor Professional. In this video, we are going to look at the basics of iParts, what they are, and how they're created. I'll also talk a little bit about Content Center since one of the purposes of iParts is to create Content Center families. Let's dive right in. For those of you who are new to iParts, an iPart is the master or parent file for a family of parts that share geometry in common. The classic example is a piece of hardware. The bolt changes size, but does not significantly change shape. We can define the geometry once and call out the differences in a table. Each row of the table represents a particular bolt size and each column is one of the parameters or properties that changes for the different members of the family. When you insert an iPart parent, Inventor will ask you which size you want, and you can pick the correct one off the list. The family members are created as they're used, or you can choose to generate them all at once. If you've used Content Center, you should notice the similarities between the two workflows. There's a good reason for that. A Content Center family is nothing more than an iPart family that's been published to Content Center. That makes knowing how to create iParts an even more important skill in Inventor. Before we get into the weeds, let's look at some high-level concepts. One justification for doing the extra work to create an iPart is that you'll be using the family members over and over again. There are some common sense rules for creating any library part which usually apply to iParts as well. The main one is that you want to keep them as simple as possible. Any unnecessary detail adds to the work Inventor has to do to render that part in a drawing. If your assemblies are large, that can cause a significant bottleneck in your top level drawings. For example, it's tempting to put the boss marks on a grade 5 bolt for easy identification. If you're using a handful of them in a small assembly, it's no big deal. However, put 1500 of those bolts in a big machine, and even though they may be too small to see at your working zoom level, Inventor will still have to render all that detail for the drawing views. Another area to watch your level of detail is the place that can cause errors or extra work for your users. Avoid unneeded features in areas where a joint or constraint is commonly placed. Don't add window dressing that makes your user's job harder. So, keep it simple is the first rule of thumb for creating iParts. The second is to plan them carefully. iParts can be edited after they're finished, but since they're a system of related files, it's not as easy as it is for a single file. Better to get everything right the first time. This is especially true if you plan to send the iPart to Content Center. Let's look at how all this plays out when creating a simple iPart of a machine screw. For this example, I'm going to create an iPart based on one of McMaster Carr's panhead Phillips screws. There's a lot of these, from size 0 all the way up to 3 8 inch. It's a good idea to start at one end of the spectrum, so I'm going to begin with the smallest of the family members. Looking at the McMaster documentation, I can get the basic dimensions of the screw. These are the numbers that will change from member to member, so I will need to set things up so that they can be managed. I'll sketch the basic shape of the screw. For any dimensions that I'm going to be controlling in my iPart table, I'll give the parameters descriptive names as I go. This will become important later. I only want to rename the parameters I'm planning on using in the iPart table. Notice also that although there are several ways to model this simple part, I've chosen one that puts all the significant geometry in a single sketch. This makes the model easy to edit. For the shoulder height of the head, which is not called out, I'm going to set it arbitrarily at half the head height. I'll talk more about parameters like that in a moment.
Now my sketch is fully constrained, and things are constructed in a way that would be difficult to break. I'll revolve the shape, and now I'm ready to add the rest of the features. This is where things get interesting. First, I need to add the thread feature. Looking at the McMaster car list, some of these screws are fully threaded and some are partially threaded. I'll need to account for that, so for the thread length, I'll specify that it equals the shaft length. I can change it in the table for the screws that have a set thread length. Now I'm going to add a chamfer to the lower edge of the shaft. This is purely cosmetic, and I know what I said earlier about unnecessary detail, but in my opinion, hardware like this just looks off without it. So, I want the chamfer there, but I certainly don't want to control it in the table, and one value isn't going to work for all the different screw sizes. So I'm going to make the chamfer value one-tenth of the shaft diameter. That way, it will change size as the screw gets bigger, but I don't have to manage it. This is an excellent way to deal with this kind of detail where it's needed. Now, we need to represent the Phillips slot in the head. This is an area where your needs are going to dictate how you proceed. At the very least, we need to be able to visually identify this as a Phillips head screw. At the other end of the spectrum, weight might be a concern, in which case we need to model the features as accurately as possible. I don't need that kind of accuracy, so just a visual representation of a Phillips slot will be fine. I'm going to use the same technique as I did with the chamfer and the head shoulder height, so I don't have to manage the size changes. Notice how the geometry in the sketch for the Phillips slot is all tied back to one of the driving dimensions. It took a bit of extra time to set things up that way, but I only have to do it once, and the Phillips slot will follow along perfectly as the head size changes. Now the model for my screw is finished. It's simple and well made, and only the critical dimensions need controlling from member to member. I'll assign it a stainless steel material, and I'm ready to start working on the eye part. I'm going to go to my Manage tab, and in the Author panel I'll select Create Eye Part. This brings up the Eye Part Author dialog box. The first row has been created and populated with any of the parameters that were renamed when the part was created. I have a few things to add to the table before I start adding members. I'll want the description property and the thread and thread class. Finally, on the other column, I'll add three custom columns called nominal size, nominal length, and thread type. A few notes here. First, the thread class won't change within this family. They're all 2A threads. If you won't be authoring the family to Content Center, you can leave that parameter out. However, it's a required field for threaded fasteners in Content Center, so I will need it for this family. The nominal size is also required, and is a good candidate for a key column, which I'll talk about in a bit. Before I go there, I'll add something in the description field, just to keep Inventor from complaining about an empty field, and then I'll select OK to close the dialog box. Inventor adds a table to the iParts browser and changes the icon for the part itself. All that was relatively easy. Now comes the harder part. I need to populate the rest of the rows with information about each family member. In this case, the information I need is on McMaster Carr's website. I'm going to open up a blank workbook in Excel. The first thing I'll do is select everything and format the cells as text. That won't totally prevent Excel from trying to convert any fraction or dash number it sees into a date, but it helps. Then I'll grab the table contents from McMaster's site and use cut and paste to drop it into my Excel table. Be careful to just get the table data if you do this. 
Anything else you grab will come over with hyperlinks and other noise and you'll have a hard time getting rid of it. It's going to take some work to get this information formatted the way that I need it, but it's still better than starting from scratch for almost 300 screws. This isn't a video about Excel, so I'm going to skip that part there. Now that I have the information in the right format, I need to transfer it into the iParts table. Back in Inventor, I'll right click on the table in the browser. Notice that I have two options for editing the table. The edit table command is good for housekeeping items like I did earlier, but for this, the edit via spreadsheet option will be much better. This opens the iParts table in Excel. Now I can copy over the various columns. I'm using the McMaster card part numbers for the file names, so I'll paste those into that column. The member column is just a counter for the database to be able to track members, so I'll use Excel's Autofill Series tool to populate each row with a unique number. Once I'm done, that leaves just the description field. I'll use another Excel trick, Concatenate, to borrow from some of the other fields to get the description field populated correctly. Now I can fill that down to get all the descriptions. Before I exit the spreadsheet, I'll take a look to see if anything jumps out at me. I want everything to be right. The farther I go, the harder it can be to fix mistakes. I'm done here for now. I'll save and close that instance of Excel, which will send me back to Inventor. My table now has all the members I've added. I'll go back into the table using the edit table command to make a few final tweaks. Notice that my description column comes in red. That's because it's a calculated column in Excel. You can change it by selecting Verify, but it will come in red every time you open this dialog. I'm going to right click on the part number column and designate it as the file name column so that Inventor will use the McMaster car numbers for the file names when it creates the family members. Then I'll designate the nominal size, nominal length, and thread type columns as keys 1, 2, and 3. When I close the dialog box, I can now right click on the table in the browser and select List by Keys. The table now sorts the members by the key columns I've designated. Now I'm almost done with my iPart. The last thing to do is test the members to make sure everything is good and that I haven't misentered any numbers. If the iPart has a small number of members, you can verify them by simply activating each one and noting what changes. I could do that here, but with almost 300 members, it's going to be tedious and time consuming. Another way to do it is to select all the members, right click, and select Generate Files. It will still take a few minutes for Inventor to create all the family members, but at least it's the computer working hard and not me. Inventor generates the children in the subfolder of the folder where the parent is saved. Once all the family members are created, I can open a new assembly and dump them all in.
You don't want to use place grounded at origin for this because it will put them right over the top of each other. Just clicking them in spreads them out so you can inspect them. The final test is to place a few members the way they'd normally be used, by placing the parent and selecting the family member off the list. This ensures that the key columns work as intended. All the family members look good, and I have no design doctor notifications, so this iPart is ready to use or author and publish to Content Center. I'll cover that process in a different place. If you're intending to publish to Content Center, you will not need the family member files you generated for testing. The test assembly can be closed without saving, and the subfolder with the family member files deleted. All you'll need is the parent part file. There's a lot more that could be said about the iPart Tools advanced features, but I hope this look at the basics was helpful. I'm Walt Jakewith for Imaginet Technologies. See you next time, and happy modeling.